okay so we got the voice we got the screen so what we'll do today is to go over uh, exam 2 from spring 2023 um, there's no guarantee of you know, whether the format of your exam is going to be the same as the one from spring 2023 the only thing that will be resembling will be the scope of the material okay so keep that in mind so the scope technically speaking is from double precision floating point number all the way through to the material that we went over on Monday. So that would be the full scope. But one thing you have to kind of keep in mind is some of the material within this range refer back to binary subtraction and binary comparison and also signed versus unsigned interpretation of numbers. So you have to kind of keep in mind that that stuff you know, can still reappear in a different form in this particular exam. So I won't be quizzing or asking questions specifically for those particular topics, but there might be some topics that require a knowledge of those you know, older topics that we have gone over in the first part of the class. All right. So first thing first, okay, you know, write down your name and your student ID because I have quite a few submissions you know, without anything on the exam paper itself. So that would be the first thing you need to do is to write down your student ID, okay, and your last name in a legible way, at least legible enough for me to enter that into my grade sheet. So once it's done with that, read the instructions carefully, okay, you make sure that you understand the, the entire your know, content. And then what we do is we will get started with question number one. So this is question number one. <clears throat> I basically give you a circuit to analyze and then you have to use the PDNC you know, trick to try to figure out what the circuit is going to do as we perform these steps that are this, you know, that are described here. So we start with B and E as input pins both being ones. We turn E from 1 to 0 and then we turn B from 1 to 0 as well and then we turn B from 0 back to 1. Okay. So you have to kind of analyze the circuit and find out what's going to happen to all of these logic gates as well as the output pins. Okay, the circuit is described in, on the next page. So, so I'm going to show you the next page. So for this one, you know, it is basically um, the same nature as the lab that we have done already on PDNC. Uh, PD stands for propagation delay, and NC stands for node continu node connectivity. So those are the two things you know, that can affect you know, how the state of one thing changes the state of other things on in a circuit in Logisim. All right, so are there any questions about you know, just this part of the question, you know, what it's describing up to this point? No questions, okay. So if there are no questions, the detail, okay, if you scroll down a little bit more, you can see you know, the description you know, of you know, how you are supposed to fill in the cells you know, in a table. It is consistent with the way that we did it with the lab assignment, with the lab activity the other day. So that means you know, to review for this kind of question, you can also you know, go back to the lab and you know, either redo the lab or you, know, you can go ahead and you know, um, you know, just kind of review how it is done. Okay? We can also talk about it, you know, you know, in a different class, like the next new class, or during the lab time today. There's no lab for today's little class, so if you're going like, okay, you know, I kind of need a refresher of this topic, we can use the lab time today to talk about that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So I'm just on. Since there are no questions about how to work this out, I'm going to assume that people understand how to do it, and we'll go ahead and start with the table. So the table is a little bit different compared to uh, the lab that we did because in the lab that we did we only have like four or five nodes you know so I can use color coding easily. For this one we have seven nodes and I cannot you know find seven different colors that are easily distinguished to the point where you guys can go like okay these two are the same those three are the same and so on. Because I don't want you know, to use your colors that are so close, especially to people who are colorblind, that they cannot differentiate. Okay, so in this case, I'm just using numbers. <clears throat> so 
So the way the numbers are used, okay, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here, just so that you know, we can take a look at the detail here. So basically everything that has a three belong to the same node. So this, this column here and this column here, they belong to the same node. Uh, the five, you know, there's one here, and there's another one here, so these two belong to the same node. Uh, the six, there are three sixes. There's one here, one here, and also one here, and then the ones are here, and here, and also here. Okay? So if you think that, you know, oh, you know, seven colors, no problem. You know, I have a really good, I have really good eyes, you know, that can differentiate, you know, minute, you know, differences between colors. Bring your color pencils or whatever you want to use to color the, the table. It's up to you. So you can, you can add additional ways to help you, you know, remind you which ones are of the same node. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> All right. So the uh, description, you know, J is the, the J is basically one particular gate. H is another gate. F is another gate. Uh, the D is a gate. And C is a gate. The rest are input and output pins. Okay. So in this case, because all the gates are NOR gates, N O R NOR gates, so I don't really have to differentiate because you know, whenever you see a gate, it is a NOR gate. So some people may say, but Tech, you have never talked about NOR gates in this class. Well, actually, I did. But some people may still you know, complain and go like, but you did not really kind of talk about the NOR gate you know, in more details. So that's why you have to read the questions more carefully. Because in the question, the first thing that I do is to explain what NOR is. X NOR Y is the same thing as the negation of X or Y. So make sure you read the questions carefully because you know, that is me telling you this is NOR, okay? All right, so getting back to the question, they're all NOR gates. One thing I would do personally, now it is up to you to decide whether this is something that you think is going to be helpful, but one thing that is going to be helpful for me is to group all the gates, you know, all the columns related to gates to, related to the same gate, you know, together. So I'm going to have to turn off the touch, you know, thing here, you know, just because I don't want to scroll accidentally. So now we have these three being a gate. Okay, let me compact that first. Uh, these three are the same gate. These three are the same gate. These three are the same gate. So visually, it is easier for me to group the columns to understand you know, which columns belong to the same gate. I always use the input gates you know, on the left of the three columns, and then the output is on the right of the three columns. So that makes it easier to find out you know, which ones are the inputs to a gate and which one is the output of a gate in this case. All right, so we start off with you know, everything being unknown. That's actually part of the description of the question is it clearly states that everything is unknown to begin with. So if you don't want to read, write you know, all the question marks here, you can just write one and then just use a line to go across the entire row to basically indicate they are all unknown you know, at the beginning of this analysis. So now we have to go kind of go back, I have to go back, you know, turn on the touch again because I have to look at the previous page. And of course, you know, it will not turn back on. Oh, there we go. Because I cannot remember <clears throat> the question itself. You know, what are the four states, okay? So in this case, um, there's actually a tool that I can use, you know, to um, lasso and, you know, kind of take those out of this context okay. okay now how do I do? oh okay I think I have to change to the pen tool lasso there we go so I can actually do something like this I'm not sure whether that works I don't think I don't think that works unfortunately so B is one E is one okay so I'll just have to kind of do it by hand E B is one E is one kind of scroll back to the other page Oops, too much. There we go. Turn off the touch. Okay, so we know B is a one, E is a one to begin with. So we put a one here and a one here. The first phase is always going to be a NC, you know, because we are changing the state of the input pins. The two input pins in this case are B and E, and they both all start off with a value of one. So now we have to propagate those values to other columns belonging to the same nodes. 
So we are talking about node 0 for E and node 1 for B. So we look up all the node zeros. So if I were you, I would just kind of linearly scan everything. Here's one, you know, zero. So it is supposed to get a value of one. Here's another one, which is also zero. Node zero, you should get a value of one. And then here's another one, your know, node zero should get a value of one. And then we also have to look up all the node ones. Okay, so you know, the last column is a node one. And then we just scan the entire you know, column here, the entire table. We have another you know, one here and then another one over here. So we will change both of those to ones as well. So we have one copied here and then another one copied over here. So that will conclude the node connectivity phase because you know, just because of how the nodes are connected, we are spreading the values of the input pins B and E to all of the other ports that are connected to these particular nodes. Are we do okay so far in terms of the concept? Okay, so this is identical to what you did with the lab. Okay, so if you go back to the lab, you know, you did exactly the same thing, except the circuit is different. All right, so the next phase is a PD, you know, or you know, uh, propagational delay, which means we analyze the gates and we ask the question of, Okay, if there's a gate or if there's a device that has at least one of its input pins changed from the previous NC row, we want to see if the output is going to change. That's what we're gonna do. So we go through all the gates. If you look at gate G, J, nothing has changed, okay? Both of the inputs are still unknown, so the output being unknown is, that's perfectly normal. Then we look at uh, gate B which has one of the input pins being a one now instead of a unknown, the other one is still unknown. So the question is, can I make any conclusions about the output in this case? Remember, these are all NOR gates. So what do you think? Can, can we determine the output of gate H at this point, knowing that one of the input pins is a one, but the other one is still unknown? Okay, so what should be the output at this point? Hmm? A, zero. a zero, very good, because it is a nor, so this should be a zero at this point. All right, why is that the case? Because it is a negated or. With a regular or, if at least one side of the or is a one, the whole thing is going to be a one. But since this is negated, so that means if at least one input is a one, the whole thing, you know, the gate is going to output a zero, because it is a negated or. Okay, all right, so we look at uh, you know, gate F, you know, okay, that one is a, that's an easy peasy one because both inputs are ones, one or one is a one, a negative one is a zero, so that's how we can tell the output is like that. Gate D has no known input at this point, so the output is definitely still unknown, and then gate C has an output of zero as well because both of its inputs are zeros. So that concludes the propagational delay, and then we go to NC again. So this time it's a little bit more troublesome because what we have to do is to look at, oh, okay, no four should now be zero because we just determined the output connected to node four is now a zero. So now we have to look for all the node fours and then update every single one of those to zeros. So it will be this one. Um, so we have this one being a zero. And that's the only other node four that we have. And then we do the same thing with node two. So with node two, you have to be a little bit more careful because there's a node two right here. So we have to update that one to zero. And I believe you know there are, nope, not node two. We're not talking about node two, sorry. That was my, my bad. <coughs> because this is a node four. Okay, one more, one more undo, or I can just kind of erase it. All right, so let me let me self-correct because it is a no, it is a no two. Sorry, you know that was that was just me getting confusing myself. This is a no two, so we have to update all the no twos. Okay, so let me go back <laughs> and update this no two, and there are only two columns corresponding to no two, so we are done with no two. Um, then we look at this one over here. 
This is a node three, so we are, we have to update all the node threes. There's only one corresponding to a node three, which is the first column. So let me just kind of double check and make sure that you know I have done all the updates correctly. Uh, node four, there's only one other node four, okay, and then node two, there is only one other node two, and then for node three. There's only one other node three. So I think I got it all covered. If you guys spot an error, just let me know, okay? Because sometimes I you know, kind of glance through the whole thing and miss one thing. All right, so that's NC. You know, the NC is not empty, and so we have to go for another PD again. So this time we can look at node J, or device J. Device J has one of its input being changed from an unknown to a zero, but this is a NOR gate. The other input is still unknown, which means the output it continues to be unknown. Now, if it continues to be unknown, I do not put a question mark here because it is not an update. Uh, we look at the other update, which is for node H. So for node H, we have now determined the second input is going from an unknown to a zero, but that's not gonna change the output because you know, the first input of node H or device H is still a one, so that means the output of device H is still gonna be a zero, so no change from the perspective of um, the NOR gate H. And then the last one that we look at is the NOR gate D, which has one input being unknown, the other input is a zero, but that is not enough to tell for, for me to make a conclusion about the output, so that means you know I do not say anything about the output because it continues to be unknown. So that's where you know you have an empty row for PD, which means you know this particular phase is done. Are we still doing okay so far at this point? Okay, all right. So now we go back to the question because I cannot remember a single thing from the question itself. I believe E is the one that is transitioning from one to a zero, but I'm not sure, so I'm gonna take a look. All right. So we want to turn on the hand tool, okay, so I can scroll. All right, so I was right, you know, E is transi transitioning from a one to a zero. So now we go back to the table and you'll kind of do the same thing, but we maintain you know, the state that we have already determined in this particular you know, table. So that what that means, is I'm only making a change from for pin E, which is node zero, from a one, which is here, to a zero. But I keep everything else as is. So now the only propagation I have to do is for node zero. So I locate all the node zeros from left to right. You know, it's good to have a more systematic way to do it. So as far as we know, um, this one should be a zero at this point. This one should be a zero because both of those are connected to um, node zero. And there's one more that connects to node zero, which is this one over here. I believe that should be it. Yep, okay. So are we still doing okay so far? We do not repropagate node one because there's not a change, okay? Node one continues to be a one, so it's not something that we have to repropagate. Then what we do is the same thing. We go to the PD phase again, you know, propagational delay. We look at all the NOR gates and see which one has at least one of its input pins changed in the previous NC row so that we can redetermine its output. So we look at device J or the NOR gate J. So the NOR gate J is not an issue because you know, none of its input got changed in the previous ANSI row. Same thing goes for device H, but for device F, okay, both of its input pins got changed from ones to zeros. So that means you know, the output is going to be a one in this case because zero or zero is a zero, but the negation of that is a one. And then we move on to device C. Device C has the first input pin being a zero, but the second input pin continues to be a one. So that means you know, the output of a zero continues to be correct. So that means I do not put a zero here because it is not an update. We are not changing the output, all right? So now, because the PD row is non-empty, we have to go for another NC 
because we have to basically go, we have to you know propagate, we have to um, update all of the other ports that are connected to the same node, which is node two in this case, and they all have to change to one. So now we look up you know, all the node twos. There's one here, you know, that has to update to one. Um, let's see, I think that's the only one. I mean, we only got two columns corresponding to node two. So that's the only thing I have to update. Then we go for PD again. So for this particular PD row, I only got one device to, you know, con to be concerned about, which would be device H, because device H has one of its input pins changed from a zero to a one. So at this point, okay, this is where it is super important to understand what, it, what does it mean when I say keep everything else the same. This one from way earlier is still a one, and then this is a new one. So at this point of time, you know, both of the input pins of H are ones, but the output is not gonna change because one or one is the same thing as one or zero. So the output continues to be a zero. So this PD row is now empty and it concludes that particular phase. Is that okay? All right. So I'm gonna just kind of pause a little bit here. Yes. Are you recording? That is a good question. I am recording. The screen is good. The audio is good too. Okay. So at this point of time, I'm just gonna say, you know, if you look at this and go like, oh no, Tac you know, still has two more transitions to go. This is gonna be boring because you know it's just you know the same tedious stuff you know being done over and over again. Well, if that is what is in your, if that's what's on your mind right now, congratulations, you're getting it, okay? Because you know, this is just all tedious work at this point. On the other hand, if you're thinking, I'm not quite getting it, then you might want to revisit the lab that we did um, or come to my office hour, which is right after class today, or since we don't have a lab today, you know, use the lab time to ask me about questions about how I came up with all of these you know, zeros and ones, okay? So, but I'm going to work out the entire thing, okay, so, which means, you know, to some people it's going to be a little bit of a boring thing. So for the next one, I believe, you know, we changed your know, B also to zero, okay, so I'm going to double check because, you know, I cannot trust my own <coughs> memory. And this is the funny thing is, you know, it doesn't change the state here you know, unless I collapse the, uh, the little toolbar thing first. So according to this, you know, we are indeed changing you know, uh, the input pin B from a one back to a zero. So that's the only transition we're gonna do to the input pins. And then we go back to the following page. I might need to zoom out a little bit now, you know, just because you know, I may run out of your know, uh, rows to display at this point. All right, so, um, Pin B, okay, let me see if I can just kind of turn off the touch here. So pin B is you know, of node one, it is it's updated to a zero. So that means I just have to look up all the columns corresponding to node one and update every single one of those to a zero. So at this point, <clears throat> ah, this classroom does not have a piece of paper that I can use you know, as a ruler. Let me see if I can have something here. That will work. So what might help you in the exam is really just a ruler, okay? You know, especially a transparent one, it's gonna be helpful because this way you can kind of line up, you know, you know the row you know, versus the column. It makes it a little bit easier to, fi to figure out which cell you're dealing with. So I'm just gonna use this piece of paper to look up your know, column one because you know, it's harder for me to do the lining up and now that I have the, the piece of paper here, I can now you know, update this one to a zero. And there's one more node one, which is this one over here, that also needs to update to a zero. Um, yep, okay, so I think we are done here. So now we go back to a PD, which means we look at all the NOR gates in this case and see which one you know, needs to update this output. So we focus on you know, from left to right. It's good to do it systematically. You know, for me, it means you know, from left to right, but you, know, you can change you know, the ordering or you can do whatever you want. So we have uh, the NOR gate H you know, having one of its input being a zero. The other one is still a one, which means the output is still gonna be a zero, but it, was, it has been a zero for a long time. 
So we're not going to write a zero here because it's not an update. And then the other one is device C. So NOR gate C is changing its second input from a one to a zero at this point. So that means you know, now, at this point, both inputs are zeros, which means the output is going to be a one. So I do have to update this one to reflect that the output of the NOR gate C is now changed from a zero to a one. Okay, so I do have to up, kind of update this one. So that means you know, we have another NC coming up. It is for <coughs> node three to update. So now I have to go through all the node threes. The first column is a node three. It has to change to a one. And then we have, I think that's the only one. Okay, I'm just double checking. Yep, that's the only one. So now we go through and go to another PD because device J now has both of, you know, at least one of its input changed. And well, it has one input still undetermined. The second input of J is still an unknown, but that's okay. Because the first input of J is now a one, and this is a NOR gate, which means the output is gonna update to a zero. So we put a zero here, and then we put another NC, you know, to propagate that zero to everything else on node six. So we, I, I have to use a piece of paper to help me figure out you know, to easily locate the other ones. And so that's a zero here. And I think that's the, oh, right Six. next to it. Hmm? Uh, never mind. Nothing. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, so having this piece of paper really helps because what I did was I was just kind of using this piece of paper to help me to look at each column individually so that you know, I'm looking for a six, right? You know, at the very, the very top of the, of the column, having a piece of paper really helps. So if you have a ruler, you know, that's, that's going to be helpful as well. <clears throat> so now that we have you know, some uh, pins you know, changing the state, we have to go to another PD again. So this time we are talking about device D. So device D now has both of its inputs being zeros. I know it's harder for you guys to see it because you don't have a, I don't have a piece of paper big enough to, you know, to apply that to the entire screen. So what I can do is kind of, kind of let you know that, you know, this is now a zero. This is also a zero. So that means the output of D is now determined to be a one. So what do we do? <laughs> we have to go for another, yeah, go ahead. Another NC, very good. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. You know, I know it's gonna look a little bit smaller now, but that's what I need to do because you know, otherwise we, we won't be able to fit everything on the screen and that can be a problem too. So I'm just you know, making everything a little bit smaller. Okay, not too much. There we go. And then turn off the touch you know, interface. So this way I can write again. All right, so we go for another NC. And this time, it is node five that is changed. So I use a piece of paper to kind of help me line up the columns. So we have this node five being changed to a one. And I'm just scanning through, okay, this is node five, but that's the origin. So that's the only one I need to change. So at this point, your know, device J or the NOR gate J has both of its inputs being zero, being ones. But that's okay, I'm not updating the output because it was outputting a zero already before. Having the extra, the second input pin also being a one does not change the output. So I don't have anything to write here, which means this entire row of NC, or, or PD, sorry, is gonna be empty. So we have a PD row here and it is just gonna be empty. So that's the end of the third phase of the question. So now we re-enable the touch interface, okay, <clears throat> and then we go back, and we, I think we are changing B back to a one, I'm not 100% sure, so yes indeed, we are changing B from a zero back to a one, so we are, we'll go back to our table, and kind of do that, uh, let me turn off the touch interface, we change B from a zero back to a one, in this NC, so now we look up all the row, I mean, node one also. So node one, you'll need to change from a zero back to a one. 
Okay, so it has a one here. And there's one more over here, like so. So having this piece of paper really helps, okay? Do you know what's going to help even, even more, even better? Is to have a piece of paper that is kind of like, like an L with a right angle, because that will line up not only the column, but also the row. So that makes it even better. So if you have, um, if you have taken like drafting classes, you might have you know, uh, certain types of uh, instrument that can help you with that. Um, there, are, there are many other cheap ways to do that, okay? Uh, go get a cardboard, you know, you know, cut up an Amazon box, okay? Just cut it so that you have an L. And then you can just use the L to line up both the columns and also the row. That really helps to make it easier to kind of figure out which cell you need to update. All right, so getting back to here, we have another PD here. And um, we look at the devices that are updated. Um, device H now has both of its inputs being ones, but the output is a zero already, so there's no update here in this particular PD row. And then the other one is device C. Device C, on the other hand, is going to change its output because it was a 1 before. Now that at least one of its input pins is a 1, the output is going to be a 0. So that's a change. So that means we have another NC following, which is updating uh, node 3 this time. So node 3 is the first column. It is ch changing to a 0. And I'm just scanning through the numbers, you know, just to make sure I'm not missing any additional threes. I think that's the only one. So now we have to go for another PD, okay? Because you know, we just changed the input pin, one of the input pins of device J. But that's okay because your know, device J is a NOR gate. The second input continues to be a one, so the output continues to be a zero, which means we don't have anything to update on this particular PD row. We are done. That concludes you know, the four phases. So are we okay with this one? Okay, so as I said a little bit earlier, if you're thinking halfway through, you're already thinking, oh, this is boring. That's good, okay? On the other hand, if you're thinking, I'm not really quite understanding what is going on, then you might want to stay you know, after the lecture time so that you know, I, can have, I can answer some of your questions, okay? All right, so we are moving on to the second question. There are only three questions in this particular exam in spring. <clears throat> and as you can see, you know, there are some additional rows. So you're not, it, there's no guarantee that you're going to use up the entire table. I can give you extra rows, you know, that may not be necessary. Okay, so moving on to question number two. So question number two is interesting. Because in question number two, I am giving you the RTL description of an instruction. So the RTL instruction in this case, or the RTL description, I should say, in this case, is C equals to asterisk A. Okay? So one thing you, you that might, okay, so as you're going through this, you might want to kind of jot down some notes of what do I want to bring to the exam? Because Exam two, just like exam one, is open book and open notes, which means anything that is on paper, and I'm not talking about e-paper, it has to be physical paper, <laughs> okay? If you handwrite or print something on a piece of paper, you can bring it to the exam. So you might want to kind of think about, what do I need to bring to this exam that might be helpful to me, okay? So as we're going through this, you can kind of jot down some notes to remind yourself. Okay, so the first thing is, um, what is that, okay? What is RTL, okay? Where do I find RTL descriptions in this class? It's the opco table, okay? So this means you, know, you might want to bring a copy, print it out and bring it with you, you know, which is the opco table, okay? Now, do you want to print out the one that I have prepared already as a Google Sheet? Sure, okay? You don't, I don't have a problem with people printing out that table and bringing, the, bringing, it, bringing it with them. But you can also reorganize things in your own way. You know, use your own spreadsheet. Just reorganize things in a way that makes sense to you. Okay, make it efficient for you to look up items, to understand items. 
So you can you can always make a copy of the spreadsheet, and then you know, ju just do all the editing that you want. I don't like the ordering of these things. It's this, it's not alphabetically sorted. It's not grouped by you know, functional groups. I don't know what Tech is thinking when he's you know, putting items on these rows. Well, guess what? You have the freedom to reorganize things as as you like it. Okay, so use exercise that freedom that you have. Okay, you know, make sure that you bring things into the exam in the most efficient way for you to work with it. Okay, all right. So, getting back to this RTL description, what does that mean when C, when I say C equals to asterisk A? It's a borrow. It's it's borrowing from the C notation. So the question is. Okay, this is assignment, which means we're using the right-hand side to update the left-hand side. But what is the asterisk? What does it mean as a unary operator in C? It's, it's a pointer. It's dereferencing a pointer. It is basically using a pointer and ask, what are you pointing at? Okay, what is the content in RAM that you're pointing at? Okay, so that is you know, uh, the description of what we want to perform, okay? So the question is giving you another table, okay? So it's giving you this table here that you have to fill in <clears throat> so that you can describe you know, what to do with the ROM output in order to get that job done. Is that okay? All right. So what do you think is gonna be, how would you get started with this? Go ahead. Um, first things first, um, we always have to um, remember the, um, the TTB. TTP, um, Tax Toy Processor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That and how that functions. So obviously, if it's using, obviously, we see that it's, it's a pointer referencing something in RAM. Mm -hmm. you know that RAM would have to be selected. Yep. Excellent reasoning, okay? I really like that reasoning. So what that means is, hey, this diagram may be helpful. Does it make sense, okay? Because you know, I have all the names for all the tunnels you know, here, as well as you know, all the components that are here. But what you said makes perfect sense, okay? So even without looking at this diagram, I can already answer a few things on that table, okay? So this is the other thing that I also want to convey is if you're running out of time, okay, you just kind of take on the things that you know for sure, okay, because at least you can get partial credit. So in this case, if I'm totally running out of time and I, 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 and the, I, I completely forget to bring the picture of the TTP you know, thing, I cannot remember everything either, okay? Even though I made the whole thing, I designed the whole thing, I cannot remember everything, but I can remember enough to basically say, okay, I know RAM is going to be in use, so that means RAM cell has to be a one. I know I'm going to read from RAM, so I know RAM load also has to be a one, okay? I know there's one register being updated. How do I know that? <laughs> because register C is getting updated, right? Register C is one of the registers in the register bank. So if one of the registers in the register bank is getting updated, I know RIEN also has to be a one. And the select of what is being updated has to reflect register A. So I need to put two zeros here because you have to read the question carefully. The question says, if a particular tunnel has two bits, then you have to use two characters to fill in that box. So it cannot just be a single zero, it has to be zero, zero. It has to be base two. Okay, so I can at least fill in this much, you know, just based on that I'm updating a register, I'm updating register A, I'm using RAM, and I'm reading from RAM. Yes? Is it? <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> Yes, it is register C that is being updated. Register A is providing the address. Okay, you know, thank you. So that means you know, I just got this part wrong because it's supposed to be register C, which is one zero to represent register C. Thank you. 
All right. So <coughs> after that, I can fill in a few more, okay? Because I know that I'm not using the ALU. I'm not performing any operation. How do I know that? Because the right hand side of the assignment is not using plus, not minus. There's no and, there's no or, and there's no uh, there's no uh, bitwise not. Okay, so that means I'm not using the ALU. If I'm if I'm not using the ALU, I can probably go here and say not using the ALU, and what I specify as the operation to the ALU ALU would not matter. Okay. Um, I think I have a few more things I can fill in just the way it is, just without looking at the diagram. Am I updating the program counter? Nope, not updating the program counter, so this has to be a zero. If, not, if I'm not updating the program counter, uh, the PC, <clears throat> the multiplexers that feed the D part of the program counter would not matter at all. And those are influenced by PC mux mux. So that means the PC mux mux is, is, does not matter. So whatever is, does not matter, you have to fill it up with question marks. The question is, how many question marks do I need here? In other words, what is the bit width of PC mux mux? Isn't it three? Yep, you're correct, because you are selecting one of eight inputs from that multiplexer. Very good. So this is all without even looking at the TTP, okay? So based on what we have talked about in class you know, already, and you do your own reviewing a little bit, you know, some more, I would expect many of you to be able to fill in this table up to this point, okay? Now, what about the rest? Well, the rest has to do with um, how do we route register A to you know, control the address that we're looking at? Well, that means your register A has to get to the A port of RAM. So that part, I kind of need to go through the, the picture. Okay, so we're going to have to take a look at <coughs> the processor itself and a few other things. So we look up the A port of RAM. It is going from, it's coming from this multiplexer. And this multiplexer has a select of, you know, the, the tonal name is ADDR MUX, address MUX. So the question is, just from this picture, can I determine what is address mux at this point? So you track it down, right? You, you track down and go like, if, if we're looking at input one of this multiplexer, it's coming from the program counter. We know we are not using the program counter to point to whatever we need to access in RAM, so it has got to be the other one, which is zero, okay? So we now go back here and go like, yep, we can fill that in too. So that has to be a zero. <clears throat> but that doesn't answer the entire question of how do we connect register A to the A port of RAM. So what we need to do is to do, kind of follow this tr trace here, okay, follow this line, and it goes all the way up here, and then goes, it comes out of the output zero of this D multiplexer. So that means, you know, from the perspective of this D multiplexer, the select has to be a Zero. Yep, that's right. Okay, so R O one D mux register output one D mux needs to be a zero. So we go back to the picture here, and then we go like, yep, this needs to be a one. Oh, I just said zero, but I wrote down one. So this needs to be a zero. All right. So that will make a connection from here to here, which means we are now looking at the register bank itself. Okay, you go like, oh, that's gonna be a dead end. Oh no, it's not a dead end because we have two more pictures that we can go through. One of those, okay, I'm double clicking to bring it up now, is the register bank itself, okay? So inside the register bank, we are looking at register output one and we have to figure out how to connect this output pin to the output of register A. Okay. What is between them? What is standing between the output of register A and register output one? Okay, let me use the mouse pointer here. What is between the output of register A and register output one as an output pin? We are, we are, we are trying to get from here to here. What is in between? It's a multiplexer. Is it the top multiplexer or the, or the lower multiplexer? 
the lower one. So we, this is the device that is standing between them, right? How do I, so how, tell me what do, I, what do I need to specify as the select in order for register A to connect to register output one? Zero, zero, very good. Because all you do is you track down this. You know, without logic sim, it's a little bit harder, but it's still vis you know, visually possible to do it. So you just track it down and go like, oh, go from here to here. Ah, input zero. So we need to specify input zero connects to the output for this multiplexer, which means register output one select needs to be zero, zero, okay? So now we go back to the question and we go here and specify that to be zero, zero. Okay, cool. Um, well, now we can go back and fill in the, the, some of the other ones that we missed the first time. First of all, are we using register output zero at all? No, we got everything that we need already, okay? We have register A connected to the A part of RAM, which means we know which location we need to address. The content of that should be routed back into register C to update register C, which means register zero is not being used at all. So <clears throat> it kind of makes sense to basically say, mm, you're not needing register output zero from the register bank. So whatever we select over there does not matter. Whatever we specify as the DMUX also does not matter because you know, when the DMUX, oh wait, hold on a second. Yeah, so when register output zero enable is turned off, the D multiplexer is turned off too. So in that case, it really means that whatever you say as the select does not matter because you know, there's no output coming out of this D multiplexer. All right, so we're almost done. <clears throat> we go back to the processor this time. There we go. And then we look at the input here and we have a multiplexer that is standing between the output of the data port and the you know, in you know, for, for the um, register bank. So now we have to determine, you know, we know RIEN is going to be a one, but we have not determined yet what is RI mux. So now we have to ask, uh, which one of these two inputs do we want to connect to the output of this multiplexer? Okay, so you just have to figure out which one is going to connect to the D port. Now, I know this one is a little bit harder, you're just visually doing it, but hopefully you have followed my advice and have done this in LogiSim a few times already, because if you, have done, if, done, if you have done this a few times in LogiSim already, then you can quite quickly follow this trace, you know, this, this wire here, and go like, okay, it goes all the way up here, and then it goes all the way across, all the way down, and then up to here. Ah, input zero is what we need out of this multiplexer, so we need RI mux to be a zero. And I am not lying when I say that I personally cannot remember which one it is. I really have to look up the diagram to figure out, oh, okay, it's input zero. And you guys would go like, but you have been teaching this class since what, 10 years ago, for 10 years already? Yeah, but I never had a need to memorize everything because you know I can always look it up. And this is why I also make the exams open book and open notes. I cannot expect you guys to do what I cannot do. And realistically speaking, you know, when you go out and become a computer engineer or a computer a software engineer, you can look up stuff, right? I mean, you can look up, I mean, these days, you can even use chat GPT when you're actually working, okay? But I can almost guarantee you that chat GPT will not help you with this. Can anyone explain why ChatGPT is not going to help you with this exam? Too responsive. Hasn't been sharing the data, data. Yes, that is correct. So ChatGPT probably has exposure to it because you know this has been around for a long time. So by the time ChatGPT 3.5 was trained, which was 2022, this you know the literature is out already. But there's only one sample. Chat GPT is a neural net based you know, learning mechanism, which means it needs a lot of exposure to the same thing in order to quote unquote understand it. So just one exposure from my notes you know, and whatnot 
is definitely not sufficient for chat gpt to quote unquote absorb the information so that's why you know chat GPT, chat gpt won't help you with anything that you have to ask about the ttp now on the other hand if you ask it to explain what is a multiplexer in an electronic circuit it will explain it if you ask what is a demultiplexer it will explain it okay but if you ask about the specifics of the processor which is you know combine a combination of those devices it won't be able to help you all right, so we only got three things left, which is the bit zero and bit 24 and bit 25 of the ROM. So now we look at the diagram, okay, not this one. We can close it now, actually. And this is the one that we need to look at. So what we are looking at here is uh, bit zero, which is right here. So bit zero, whoo, all the way up here is the enable of the instruction register. We're not updating the instruction register. We just want to update register C in this case, so we definitely do not want it to be a one. So that means we can go back to here and say, nope, we do not need that to be a one. We, in fact, we don't want it to be a one. We don't want to update the instruction register. And then we go back to the diagram and figure out what is bit 24 doing. So bit 24 is the second to the last bit here. So we are tracking, it's harder for me to point here. We're tracking this wire. So this wire goes all the way to select what input from the multiplexer connects to the micro code pointer. So normally, we just increment. So that means that we want to use input one. <clears throat> so going back to the question, we want this to be a one. <coughs> and then the, for bit 25, bit 25 goes into the input of the OR gate here, and then the output of the OR gate goes into the clear port of the register. We don't want to clear the register just yet. We want it to do the operation, which is copying whatever is at location at the location the register A points to, and then use that to update register C. So we don't we're not quite ready to reset the <coughs> micro code pointer. So that means you know the bit 25 <coughs> excuse me should be a zero. So we come back here. We put zero here. Okay. So now you guys are going to be asking. <coughs> some of you <coughs> will be asking, how do I find this stuff here? It is in the ROM of the processor. So everything is here. Here is in the ROM of the processor, except for the question marks, because you cannot specify a bit as an unknown or a question mark. So all the things that are corresponding to question marks here are zeros in the ROM. <clears throat> so that's the only part you cannot just say, so if I have a copy of the ROM, <coughs> and I know what opcode we are talking about, can I just copy a bunch of bits and fill in all of these fields? Yes, for the most part. For all the ones that are not question marks, you can just, you know, everything here is coming from the ROM itself. Yes? Is there a reason, like, you put them as question marks that when, like, <coughs> so, so the thing about the question marks is, um, I can specify this as zero 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 one zero one zero zero one one and so on. It it wouldn't change anything, because AL, the ALU is disabled, so it's not going to do anything. Okay. But in the ROM, I cannot say you know you can do whatever you want to do with these three bits because the ROM has to be has to specify either a one or a zero for every single bit position. So in the ROM, I just specify by default. If I don't care, it is a zero. It depends on the ROM. Like no ROM can specify a zero. It can, it can specify an unknown. It has right. to be a zero or a one. All right. <clears throat> Alrighty. So do we have any questions about this one, or what you need to bring with you to help answer these questions? Now there's one more that I have not shown you that you might want to bring with you too, just in case. It is the ALU. <clears throat> okay. Now for those people who are asking, uh, where do we get these your PDFs? Can somebody help me answer that question? In the it's not in the module, but it's in the announcements okay in the announcements okay so one of the announcements has three hyperlinks and they link to three PDFs which are the ones that I have just shown you 
Alrighty, so now we are ready for the last question. Are we ready or do we want to? Okay, all right, cool. All right, so I can scroll to the last question. Okay, this is question number three, which is also a very interesting and fun question to answer. Okay, so for this one, I think I need to zoom all the way back out so that I can give myself a little bit of room to write the answer. Not a whole lot of room is needed, but I just need a little bit. So I'm going to scroll up until we get to the part that is actually needed. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to read the question with you. Um, let x be blah 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 is a hexadecimal number. Well, I really should not need the thing in parentheses because I have already explained in class that 0x is a prefix to tell you whatever is following is a hexadecimal or base 16 number. But in this case, might as well just kind of give you the extra you know, information, even though I think most of you should not need it. <coughs> um, I also gave you VDX, okay, VD of X, which is you know, this definition up here. <coughs> that defines how a double precision floating point number is formatted. In other words, for someone who did not study at all, okay, who basically go like, I did not even know that double precision floating point number is going to be on the test, that definition gives you everything that you need to answer all of the questions in this one. Okay? <clears throat> so we'll talk about you know, why that is the case. So think of a double precision floating point number as a base two scientific notation where VD of X is sine times the mantissa times two to the power of E. S is the sine, which is negative or one, negative one or one. M is the mantissa normalized as a coefficient and E is the actual exponent of two. Express X in base two, you can use the dot 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 notation as long as you indicate the actual number of a repeating digit. So that means if you have a whole bunch of zeros, you just say dot, 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 you know, zero, zero, dot, 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 another zero, and then you tell me how many you know, there are. Okay, so what, this, what part one is asking is convert it from base 16 back to base two, okay? So the four is a zero, one, zero, zero. The zero is a zero, 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 zero. <clears throat> the three is a zero, zero, one, one. The two is a zero, zero, one, zero. And then the eight is, okay, I'm losing track. The three is a zero, zero, one, one again. And then the eight is a one, zero, zero, zero. And then we also know that from this point on, it's just going to be all zeros. So we have you know, zero, dot, 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 zero. You just have to tell me how many zeros there are here. So how many zeros should we specify here? Well, we just have to take a look at how many we have already specified. So we got 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24. So we got 25, 24 out of 64 already specified. So that means how many zeros are we trying to specify here? There are 40 of them. Yep, exactly. So you just say there are 40 of these things. So that answers your part one already. <clears throat> Part one does not require an explanation. It just wants you to convert from base 16 to base two. Okay, so here's the question that some people may have. I hope nobody has that question, but just in case, how did I come up with this bit pattern here from four zero three two three eight blah, blah, blah? How can I do base conversion so fast? I thought base conversion needs you know, either multiplication, you know, power exponent, or division, or mod, or something like that. How did I do this one so quickly? I mean, base 2 and base 16 play very nicely together. Mm -hmm. Just one digit of base 16 is equivalent to four digits. Of exactly four digits. digits. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, so you can just convert one digit to four. Yep. But how do I do that? Tag, you never show us how to do something like that. Or did I? Yeah. I think I showed you the table, yeah. OK? So look up the table. If you can say, if you say, okay, I got that table down already, it's all in my head already, I, I got it, you don't need that table in the exam. On the other hand, you go like, no, I can get here from one to nine, zero to nine, but after nine, I'm not really sure. 
copy and paste that table from somewhere on the internet or just you know, kind of write it down you know, on your notes, bring it with you to the exam, then you have that table to look up. All right? Or you can just kind of go through the video that we have recorded for this class, pause that particular screen, okay? Take a screenshot, crop only that portion out, slap it onto your, you know, your own notes here, and print it out along with everything else that you also want to print out. So tons of ways to do that. <clears throat> All right, so question number two does require an explanation. It, ex it says, explain step-by-step, step, starting with the bit pattern, what is the biased exponent in base 10. Okay, so now you have to remember, what is the biased exponent? What is the bias? What does it mean when something is biased? Okay, so let's just say that I totally forget to study for this test, okay? I look at this definition here, okay? So the one thing that is biased is here. This is the only part that has something to do with the exponent. Does that make sense? Nothing else. Is, has anything to do with exponent. So if I'm asked, being asked about a question about the exponent or something, it has to, oops, sorry about that. Let me turn off the, uh, the touch interface. So it has to be coming from right here, okay? So if that is the whole exponent, what is the biased exponent? The biased exponent is before we subtract the 1,023. That is the biased exponent. So when the question is asking, you know, step by step, starting with the bit pattern, what is the biased exponent of two in base 10? That means you know, point out to me which portion, okay? There are several ways to do it. You can say your know, bit, okay, 52 to 62 are the biased exponent. <clears throat> And then you just say, you know, it is one zero 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 one one in base two, which is one thousand twenty four plus two plus one, which is one thousand twenty seven. That answers the question. Okay, so that's biased. So now we get to number three. <clears throat> which asks, what is the actual exponent of 2 in base 10? So you basically just explain it is 1,027 minus the bias amount, which is 1,023, and that is a 4. Okay? So we get to question number 4, or part 4 of the same question. Explain step by step, starting with a bit pattern. What is the binary mantissa? The mantissa is basically a normalized coefficient answer this part with a binary number so I want it to be specifically binary okay so if you look at the definition here this part looks like a coefficient to me because it is being multiplied to a power of 2 yes sorry where did you get uh, 1023 from? it's from here oh, okay. yep so this entire thing you know, gives you all the answers that you need you just need to know where to look okay Oh, okay, so did that answer the question? Okay, excellent. So now we move on to question number four, or part four of the same question. What is the binary mantissa? So you look at this whole thing here, and you ask uh, which part is the mantissa? What do we use the mantissa? The mantissa is basically a coefficient that we multiply with, multiply to the power of two in this case. So you look at this whole thing here, there are three distinct portions, right? The first portion here can either be a one or a negative one. That doesn't look like, that looks like the sign, but not the mantissa, because the mantissa should not be negative one, okay? Because you know, the coefficient should always be zero to some you know, non-negative value. So I can rule out this part here, which leaves, leaves behind only this part, because this, is, this whole thing here is the power of two. It is not the coefficient. The old coefficient can only be this part here. Is that okay? So since I'm asking about the coefficient, not asking about the fractional part of the coefficient, so that means give me this entire thing. So now I can say uh, the, the fractional part of the mantissa is bit 0 to bit 
51. Uh, okay. So you go like, how did you get that, Tack? You know, I thought you did not study for this test. Well, I did not study for the test. I extracted this information from the definition itself. How? Where do you think I looked and go like, oh, okay, so that's the beginning, that's the end. Yep, the range of i, right? You know, it's going from bit zero because you know, when i is zero, x zero is the bit that we're looking at. When i is 51, it is x of 51 that we are looking at. That tells me that, oh, okay, that's the range of the bits that will give me the fractional part. But it's not giving me the whole mantissa because we have to add one to that fractional part, okay? So from here, we just have to say the mantissa itself, you know, the, an the actual answer is going to be one point followed by the fractional part of the mantissa. So that would be this part here. So that's going to be 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and then a bunch of zeros. I don't have to kind of write that whole bunch of zeros. So that's all I'm going to have to do. All right. Now, obviously, you know, in your version of exam two, the format is not going to be like this. Okay, so I just want to warn people, you know, because <clears throat> I'm trying to remember which test it was. Oh, it was the, for this class. For exam one, in question number, if I remember correctly, number two, okay, I actually kept the entire format, but I asked, you know, something that's, I think, from an addition to a subtraction or the signs are different, you know. But a bunch of people use exactly the same reasoning, which did not make any sense. Because you know, when you try to figure out how many bits are needed, you have to compare to the bound that is relevant relative to the sign of the value. So in the question from last, from spring, one of the numbers is non-negative, so we have to compare that to the positive end of the signed representation. And then a bunch of people kept using that end to compare to negative numbers, which did not make sense. Okay, so that means you know, don't try to copy the steps from the sample questions in a test from a previous semester. Okay, do not try to copy the steps. That will not work. Well, okay, it might work for a few steps, but it's not going to work in general. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so step five is asking, express the mantissa as a sum of base 10 whole numbers and fractions, such as two plus one plus one third, and then quickly in parentheses, it says the example is clearly wrong, but the format is correct. Okay, Wh why would you have a two? Why would you have a one divided by three in this particular answer? You should not have those, okay? So for five, we say it is one plus, Okay, um, or I can say 1.00111 in base 2 is 1 plus 0 over 2, 0 over 4, 1 over 8, 1 over 16, and then 1 over 32. So that would be the correct answer. Okay, why? Because this represents how many halves we have, how many quarters we have, I mean eighths, sixteenths, and thirty seconds. Okay, that has to do with base conversion. So this is why I said a little bit earlier that even though the scope is from uh, double precision floating point number to the uh, architecture of the processor, you still need to remember some of the things that we have talked about earlier because you know, you know, the sub part of the answer like this depends on your understanding of base conversion. <clears throat> All right, so we now have only one part left, which is number six. So part six is asking just compute the whole thing, show the number, show the answer as a base 10 decimal number, such as 4.567, which means you know, your answer is probably not gonna be 4.567. <clears throat> All right, and, and I need to scroll a little bit here you know, because I just ran out of space to write the answer. Okay. So for six, all it's really asking you to do is to kind of do the whole thing. So now you have to say um, V D of X 
it's going to be you know the previous answer here okay um, I'll, I'll just kind of write the whole thing okay maybe not all the tedious parts that are not needed so we have 1 8th plus 1 16th plus 1 32nd then the whole thing has to be multiplied to 2 to the power of 4 because we figure out the, the exponent of 2 much earlier, right, in an earlier step. So now we just have to perform this calculation. <clears throat> and, you know, that would be the same thing as this entire thing times uh, 16, right? So, okay, I, I'll do this step by step, like really step by step. And then you do some simplifications, okay? You go like, hmm, okay. So that is 16 plus two plus one plus one half. Add these up, okay? You have what? 19.5, I think. Looks like 19.5 to me. And that's it. Easy peasy. I even finish it, you know, with seven minutes left But remember, I've been talking, explaining, you know, telling you guys what you might need to bring with you, that sort of thing at the same time. I'm not just writing the entire time. <clears throat> All right, so given this is the spring test, what are you going to do to prepare for your exam? Definitions. Okay, start with definitions. Very good, okay. So no pun intended, but definitely put definitions on the pieces of paper that you're going to bring with you, okay? But the key is to identify what definitions you're going to need, okay? So that's important. Uh, what else? What else are you going to do to practice or to get ready for this test? Study. Okay, but how do you study? So for the three questions, the way you study would be a little bit different. The first question is just, you know, okay, I'm going to present myself with a different circuit, right? And then I will do it by hand. I will double check the answer using logic sim. Okay? You can use the same circuit here. Just give yourself a different transition. Start off, start off with different input pins, transition you know, each pin, one pin at a time, okay? And then try to use the table to predict what is the output of each phase. And then do the same thing in logic sim. So you can cross check and double check that at the end of a phase, you got it right. Okay, so that's one thing that you can quite easily do with Logisim to help you. So that's for question number one. What about question number two? How do you prepare for something like question number two? You do the same thing with different You can do the same thing with a different RTL, but remember, I can change the direction of the question. In other words, I can give you the table itself, and then I ask you, how do you describe that in RTL description? I can flip it around. So what you do need to know is how to read the processor architecture in Logisim. Okay, you need to understand what is inside the register bank, what is inside the ALU, and how the processor works in general. But how do you learn that? Tech, you never taught us how to do that. Or did I? What did I recommend? Quite a few times. Yes. Yeah. Mm hmm Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say write a little simple program and then watch it run like every every tick. Yep. Watch not it, well, okay, so there are three ticks corresponding to the fetch phase of the execution, one tick corresponding to the decode. But after the decode is where things are really important. That's where you need to really pause and look at how things are connected, right? So what I want to do, <clears throat> since we have a few minutes left, and since we don't have a lab today, is to kind of give you an idea of what instructions we're dealing with. So they're all in the opcode table, OK? So this is basically just a replication of things that we have already talked about. So we talked about JMPI instruction and all the conditional branches. So we got JCI, JSI, JOI, JLI, 
and then JZI, okay, not in that particular order, but it's the same family. This one is unconditional. All of these are conditional branches. I did go through step by step, you know, to explain how they work, but you need to understand that too. So not watching the video, but going through this exercise by yourself, I want you guys to be able to explain how does JLI branch if and only if the L flag is a one? Okay, so go through that exercise. But once you understand one of the five in the group, you know, the rest is kind of like, eh, about the same thing. So I would not want you to have to go through each and every single one of these you know, individually. Um, and then we have a different family. You know, we have add, we have subtract, we have uh, and, we have or, we have not, and then right shift. All of these belong to the same family because they all use the ALU, okay? Now, even though they belong to the same family, only two of these would actually change the L, the O, and the sign flag. Well, actually, I should say just the, those two. <laughs> no, not these three, these two, okay? So these two would actually, you know, okay, I keep. <clears throat> these two would actually do the overflow flag and the L flag. They would affect the overflow and the L flag the rest would only affect the other flags. I think these two, okay, this, this, and also the C flag. The rest would only affect the Z flag itself because it will only determine whether the um, answer or the operation results in the zero or not. So it only affects the Z flag. And then we have increment and decrement that do not affect any flag at all by design, okay? So you might want to find out, okay, this is one thing that you can do is to find out how increment and decrement work. How can they add one to a register when you only specify a single register? How, where does that extra one come from? Okay, try to answer that question. And unlike the other things that go through the AMU, increment and decrement do not change the flex register. How does it get it done? So you might want to ask those questions because you know, they are all laid out in the TTP diagram itself. You just need to read the diagram, trace the lines around, and figure out why that is the case. Okay? <clears throat> so these two stand alone. And then we have the CMP instruction, which is kind of like the subtract instruction with one quote unquote minor difference. It doesn't store the difference back into one of the registers. It just it goes through the whole motion of a subtraction, but it doesn't store the result. So in many ways, compare is really just a subtract, but without storing the, you know, the difference. Um, and then we have the three instructions that will access memory. So one is LDI, which is the only way to load a predetermined value into a register. And then we have LD and an ST. Um, out of the three, I have gone through two of those you know, really in detail in this class. So the third one is the one that you might want to focus on, okay, as a practice, is the third one. Now, I cannot remember in this class which two I have gone through personally. I think I did the LDI and then one of these two, okay? So the other one, whatever is left, is the one that you probably can go through because I haven't talked about it. So if you can go through the whole process and figure out Oh, so this is how we do this. That would be beneficial, okay? So these two belong to one single family because they are all gonna change, either change or read from RAM to update a register. Um, and then we have just the usual stuff here, which is no op and halt. I won't be, I'm not gonna be too concerned about these two. Uh, one does not do a single thing. The other one says, you know, well, thou shall not pass. You know, no, con no execution beyond this point, basically. So they're not, I wouldn't too worry too much about the no up and the hold instruction. So that's about it. I mean, that's about all the instructions that we have. There are a few instructions that we have really, we have not really talked about. Um, they are important. One of those is important later on, but it's not going to be in, to, in this exam. But other than no up and hold here, yeah, which we kind of just kind of talk about, you know, one does not do a single thing. The other one basically stops the processor from you know, going any further. We have talked about all of the other ones as families of instructions. So that means you know, to study for the exam for question number two, that's what you need to do. So I'm gonna repeat this. 
I know, you know, it sounds bad, but I'm going to repeat it. Do not overstudy the answer to this specific question because it is not going to help. Okay? And then for <clears throat> the last question, for question number three, which is basically asking you about uh, double precision floating point numbers, how do you prepare for that particular question? <clears throat> Just understand this definition. That really is the one thing that you need to understand. That and base conversion, but we talked about base conversion a while back already, so I'm assuming that you already have an understanding of base conversion. But otherwise, this, this is defining the double precision floating point number format. How do we utilize and interpret the bits, you know, the zeros and ones, you know, those 64 zeros and ones? How do they give us, how do, how do they represent a value together? It's summarized in one single definition. So being able to understand this particular definition is the key. It really is the key. All right, so do we have any questions about, you know, how to, what is in the scope and or how to prepare for the exam? We have one more lecture, so in case you're studying over the weekend, and then go like, okay, I'm not really sure about this, you know, what that means or, you know, how to apply that. You know, we can talk about it on Tuesday. Um, I still have office hours every day. So today's office hour is right after the lab, but I'm going to convert the lab into its own office hour too. And then on uh, Thursday is from 8 to 9 a.m. On Friday is 8 to 9 a.m. And then we have Monday, which you know is right after the class. And then on tu next Tuesday is from 8 to 9 again. And so we got quite a few office hours, you know, in case you want to kind of talk to me about, you know, get some clarifications or explanation of things that you are not quite getting, okay? So, so try to use all of those resources and make sure that you bring your pieces of paper with you, whatever you think is going to help you, bring that with you. So I, I cannot think of anything else to say. So if you have questions, go ahead and ask. Okay. All right. Yes. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> are you available like from twelve o'clock as well? From noon uh, on which day? Today. Well, today you know I am available from now. You know, basically to two thirty. Okay. So I'm going to stay in this lab um, as long as there are students here, and then I'm going to go to my office. So if I do get to the office and before my actual office hour, you just knock on the outside door and I'll come open it. Okay. All right? All right. So I'm going to stop the recorder. So we, I got the whole thing recorded today, which is great. <clears throat> and I'll